Hi, I'm Sunit Mittal for Heart Rhythm TV. I'm joined today by Atul Verma from Montreal, and we're at the European Heart Rhythm Association meetings in Berlin, Germany, where yesterday the 2024 uh, consensus statement, guideline statement on AFib ablation was updated. Uh, Atul, you were a call author. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Great. So this is, I think, the fourth iteration of these guidelines since we started in 2007. Why was there a feeling that these guidelines needed an update? Yeah, so so if anything, this update was a little overdue, Sunit, because as you remember, there was a 2007, then there was a 2012, 2017. Uh, so every five years, there was an update, and it was led by HRS. Uh, then I guess the it was ERA's turn to lead. Um, so it, it ended up being a little bit late, 2024. Uh, but having said that, I think with all the new technological developments we're seeing, the introduction of, for example, PFA, the amount of clinical trial evidence that has come out and sub-studies analyses that have come out over the last few years, I think is definitely time for an update. Great. And in a few minutes, I wondered if you could highlight for the audience what you feel were some of the big takeaways or the big updates in these guidelines relative to the last guideline statement? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest uh, changes on the indication side is that for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, catheter ablation now receives a strong recommendation even in drug-naive patients. So before, we, we kind of always hedged our bets a little bit on the drug-naive population. We said for sure in drug-resistant patients, but I think with the new trials on early AF, first-line AF ablation in paroxysmal patients, the committee felt there was enough evidence to upgrade that into a very strong recommendation. Um, the guideline, you know, still steps sidesteps the issue of asymptomatic mm -hmm. atrial fibrillation and whether or not we should be doing that. So there's still not a recommendation for that but it does recognize that that's probably something that's coming. Um, in terms of techniques of ablation, uh, not much has changed, although there is a very nice section, and I'm biased here because I helped write it, but there's a very nice section on pulse field ablation. And so for people who just want to get some of the basics on PFA and not necessarily the tools and the toys, there is a very nice section in this guideline written about that. You spent a lot of time in your career well known for trying to help us understand what besides pulmonary vein isolation, you know, may be of value uh, in patients with AFib undergoing ablation. Any change in our understanding uh, in, in what we should be doing for patients with respect to that issue? Yeah, great question. Uh, unfortunately, not much. Um, so I think the, the, the only big change was based on the DCAF2 results. There was a class red recommendation mm -hmm. because remember, they're not using the one, two, a, right. two B sort of thing. They're using the absolutely should do, maybe do, and then don't do. And for the DCAF2 approach using MRI and persistent patients, there was a sort of do not do this because of the signal of harm in DCAF2. However, there is a caveat, there is an asterisk that further clinical trials may be warranted. So for now, don't do it unless it's part of a clinical trial. trial. Now, though, you presented some really novel findings on the blanking period. Now, you know, this is something that's been there for a long time. The three-month post-ablation blanking period has been widely accepted in the literature and it was a pretty important change to this concept. I thought it was one of the more important changes I heard uh, yesterday. I wondered if you could share a little bit to those who weren't here about, you know, what this change is and why the guideline uh, writers thought this is the time to make this change. Yeah, this was a topic of considerable discussion. And uh, there were a variety of opinions being expressed. Uh, some people wanted to do away with the blanking yeah. period altogether. Uh, there were some people who said, well, we don't have enough evidence to change it from three months. Uh, but after all of that discussion and a review of the evidence, the big change is that the post-ablation blanking period has now been reduced to only eight weeks yes. 
instead of 12 weeks. Um, so for anyone who's planning a clinical trial now in AF ablation, I would strongly suggest that you adopt the new eight-week blanking period. And for industry partners, um, the previous HRS iterations of the guideline always included a representative from the FDA so that FDA people could help design trials in line with the document. In this era version, there was no participation from either the FDA or the CE Mark people. So if you're doing a trial through the FDA and you belong to industry, uh, I would strongly suggest to them that you point out this important chain. Yeah, no, this is great. I mean, I think some people uh, feel like that could even be shorter. You know, four weeks, there's some data, but I think it's a real step up to at least go from three months to uh, two months. Wonder, was there any thought uh, or any understanding yet whether the blinking period differs based on the energy source being used for ablation? Obviously, we have more data for RF and cryo, uh, but do we think the same rules will apply for PFA or just something we need to study a little bit more? Yeah, great question. So the data that was used to switch from the 12 to 8 weeks came predominantly, it came from a number of sources. But a couple of the big clinical trial sources were the ADVICE trial, which was, of course, radiofrequency, the CircaDose trial, which, of course, was cryoballoon. So at least we were representing the two major thermal sources. And the conclusion from the sub-analyses of both of these trials is that by the time you get recurrences happening in the third month, the chance of long-term success is under 10%. And the chance of having a late recurrence is almost 60 times higher. Yeah. So that, that basically proves that that third month of the blanking period is not useful. Uh, in terms of PFA, we don't know the answer, to be honest. Uh, but from the experience of the trials thus far, it seems like the blanking period for PFA definitely doesn't need to be longer. Uh, but may need to be in that four to six week range. So I think the eight weeks is, is uh, by chance, a very good uh, selection for all of the energy sources. No, this is great. I think this is important information that our uh, uh, practitioners can use, you know, in the office, uh, you know, next week. I think it helps us inform clinical practice. It gives us a little bit of a better idea on what to tell our patients if they're having a recurrence and especially helps us determine when a repeat procedure or other intervention uh, may be needed. So thank you very much. Uh, congratulations on these new guidelines and your contributions to making them. And thanks for spending a few minutes with me today on Heart Rhythm TV. Thank you, Sunit. It was a pleasure. Very good. 